Hello there, my name is Florian and I welcome you to IT Tech Tips. Have you ever been in a situation like promoting a project or talking about an IT system and there was the CEO or the finance guy talking about SLAs, cost of opportunities and return on investment and you didn't have a clue what they were talking about but it would have been relevant to the discussion? That's why I have put together a list of the top 10 business expressions which are useful for you as an IT professional. Let's have a look. First, let's talk about SLAs, which stands for Service Level Agreement. An SLA is an agreement between you, as a provider, and a customer. An SLA can regulate many different things depending on what system it is designed for. For example, in an SLA you can agree upon the availability of a service, like 4 nines, which stands for 99.99% that allows the system to be down for 52 minutes per year. Or it could even stand for a 5.9 system, which is 99.999%, which only allows for a downtime of five minutes per year, which is really low. An SLA can define how fast you have to react to an incident. There's the term ASA, average speed to answer, it could be one business day or one hour or whatever you agree upon with the customer. It can also define how quick a task must be completed, which is also called TAT, a turnaround time. This could be a week or a day or a month. Also, it depends upon what you agree with the customer. An SLA usually has a cost to the customer, so the compensation is also agreed on in the SLA. And it can also mean that you have to pay repercussions if you don't meet the SLA. For example, if you agree upon a 4.9 availability and your system is down for two hours in a year, then you have to pay this repercussion to the customer because you didn't meet the SLA. Now let's talk about some different kind of costs. For example, in this slide, the opportunity costs. The opportunity costs are the costs of missed opportunities. For example, your customer wants a shop software created. The estimated sales per month out of this software would be $100,000. Your project takes two months to complete so the customer will not make any sales for two months. The sales would have then been worth $200,000. So the missed opportunities in these two months are $200,000. In this specific example, if you could speed up your project by a month, you could sell it for approximately $80,000 more expensive because the customer would still benefit because he had one more month for sales, which is $100,000, minus your $80,000, which the project was more expensive because it was implemented much faster. So the customer would still have $20,000 plus. But of course, you have to be aware of competition, which might could realize the project even faster. Another example, your system is implemented for $50,000. But the people using this system are not that productive because the system is slow. The productivity would be estimated 20% higher with a system for $100,000, so twice the price. Depending on the salary of the people, the more expensive system could actually be cheaper because the employees would be more productive and they would therefore have less cost of opportunities. Now let's talk about upfront and operating costs. Upfront costs are costs you have to pay in the beginning of a project or when you buy a system. Recurring or operating costs you must pay on a regular basis. For example, on-premise server 1 costs $50,000 upfront and $1,000 per month to operate. The cloud server 
would cost zero dollars upfront, but three thousand dollars per month to operate. So after one year, the first server will cost sixty-two thousand dollars, and the second server will cost only thirty-six thousand dollars. But after two years, the first server will cost seventy-four thousand dollars in total, and the second server will cost sixty-four thousand dollars in total. You see, the difference gets smaller. After five years, the first server would cost one hundred ten thousand dollars in total, but the second server would be at one hundred eighty thousand dollars. So. Depending on how long you operate the system, the system with the higher operating or recurring costs in the long run gets more expensive. Here's a quick diagram to visualize what I've just said. As you can see, the curve of the server 1 starts a little higher, but then it's rather flat and the curve of the second server starts at zero, but is rather steep. And somewhere in the middle, there's a crossing point, and that crossing point also has a name. We get to that in one of the next slides. The next term is TCO, which stands for Total Cost of Ownership. This one is pretty easy because we've basically covered it in the last slide. How much does the system cost in total for the complete life cycle of the system? which includes planning, implementation, operation and decommissioning. It may include, of course, other stuff as well. With the server example from the previous slide, and if we assume that the system has a lifespan of five years, server one will cost $110,000 in total, which is the TCO, and server two would cost $180,000 in total. In this example, you would need to have a really strong non-financial argument to go for server 2. For example, scalability, a better SLA, improved performance or a cleaner architecture for your complete system. But probably the customer would go for server 1 in this example. Now, another business term you will hear quite often is break-even. Break-even is the point where the total cost and total revenue are equal. You could use a break-even analysis to compare two systems, for example. So if a system has a TCO of $100,000, the revenue generated by the system would be $20,000 per year. The break-even point would therefore be after five years. $100,000 divided by $20,000 per year equals five years. If the system would have a life cycle of over five years, then it should be implemented. If it would have a life cycle which is smaller than five years, then not. Of course, again, this is purely financially speaking. There are usually other things you will want to consider as well when deciding which system or which architecture to implement. Let's make another example. System A costs zero dollars upfront and one thousand dollars per month. System B costs twenty-four thousand dollars upfront and zero dollars per month. After two years, twenty-four months, both systems cost the same amount of money, which is twenty-four thousand dollars. The break-even point, therefore, is after two years. So. If the system is operating for larger than 24 months or two years, then system B is cheaper because it has no monthly costs. If it runs for less than 24 months, then system A would be cheaper because it has no upfront costs. As you can see, all the terms we've heard in the last few slides come together in this slide. Here's another diagram to show you this crossing point I've been talking about a few minutes ago, which is called the break-even point. The next expression is pretty simple. It's cash flow. As the name suggests, this is how much money goes in 
and out of a company or an individual. Let's make an example. System A costs $50,000 upfront and $1,000 per month. System A generates a revenue of $20,000 per year. So the cash flow in the first year would be minus or negative $42,000. Because the system cost $50,000 to buy or implement and to operate it costs $1,000 per month, which is $12,000, but it generates a revenue of $20,000. So it's minus 50, minus 12, plus 20, which equals minus $42,000. The cash flow in the second year of running the system would be plus $8,000 because in the second year there are no upfront costs because you already paid for that in the first year. So it's the revenue of $20,000 minus the running costs of $12,000, which equals a positive cash flow of $8,000 in the second year. Again, I want to emphasize that this is a simplification this is of course not the cash flow of a company. You would have to take into account other financial sources as well. Now let's talk about ROI or return on investment. The ROI is a percentage which shows the worth of an investment. In economics, ROI is a really complicated formula which takes into account a lot of stuff, but you can boil down the formula to a really simple one. So the ROI equals to the profit divided by the investment. As an example, your system has an estimated TCO, total cost of ownership, of $100,000. The estimated value generated by this system is $120,000. The lifetime of the system is five years. The profit over five years is $20,000, which is the value generated, $120,000, minus the TCO 100,000. This results in 20%. So the profit is 20,000 divided by 100,000 equals 0 0.2, which is 20%. So the 20% divided by five equals 4%, which of course is also not an exact result. You can compare the ROI of this system with a 4% ROI to the ROI of other systems to help decide which of these systems you will want to implement. In other words, if you want to have a good chance of selling your system, your system should have a high ROI for the customer. The next expression is one that most people only know by the title and the OK button you click without reading it. It's the EULA or end user licensing agreement. This is a bit similar to the SLA because it's also an agreement but between the end user or the employer of the end user and the software manufacturer. The EULA regulates what the manufacturer can do with data of the end user and if he is allowed to collect data of the end user for example. It can also regulate how the end user must use the software, for example, on how many devices or what types of systems. It can regulate whether the end user is allowed to change the software or redistribute the software. It also regulates what kinds of responsibilities the software manufacturer has. For example, if his software damages the system the software runs on, if you take the time to actually read a EULA, which I strongly suggest, by the way, you can often see some general expressions where the software vendor denies any liability of any damage his software does to another system. So you should really read the EULAs before running a software. Another expression which is especially useful for software engineers is the software escrow. A software escrow can be used if you are developing and distributing a standard software to a customer. 
The customer wants some security that if you're unable or unwilling to continue working with the customer, the software you sold him will still be able to run and to be updated in the future. But you as a developer usually don't want to hand out the source code to the customer. So we have a conflict. But there's a solution to this conflict. You can involve a trusted third party. This third party must be trusted by, of course, the customer and you, and it should be neutral. And you agree with the customer to certain conditions, the so-called release conditions, in which this third party can hand out the source code to the customer. For example, if you are bankrupt, or you don't want to provide services to the customer anymore, or if you change significant parts to the software which makes the software unusable to the customer, there could be many reasons. So you then give the source code and the documentation and the release conditions to this neutral third party. And if one of the release conditions occurs, the third party, which is called the escrow agent, will hand out the data to the customer. Here's a little animation to show what I've just told you. Here's you and the customer and you agree upon release conditions. You then involve the third party, the escrow agent, and you hand over the release conditions and the software to the escrow agent. Then you go bankrupt. And the customer, the licensee, asks the escrow agent, hey, here's the release conditions are met. Please give me the software and the escrow agent will then hand over the software because one of the release conditions was that if you went bankrupt, he's allowed to hand over the software. The last topic I'm covering today is the proof of concept or short POC. A proof of concept is the core of a solution. It proves that the whole system would work by creating just the core part of the solution and proving that this core part works. It is meant to be created with as little effort and therefore investment as possible, just to showcase that the system is working. For a larger project, a customer usually only greenlights the continuation of a project after a proof of concept in the beginning of the project. Some examples for a proof of concept could be an API to one object in an ERP instead of all objects or one mailbox on a new mail server instead of all mailboxes or a site-to-site -site VPN connection to one location of the customer instead of all locations or the core algorithm of a software but without any user interface or one workplace hardware readily configured to use instead of all workplace hardwares. So that's a proof of concept. After watching this episode, you should now be more confident in your next meeting with the CEO or a finance guy. If I have missed an expression, please let me know down in the comment section. And if you like this video, as always, please click the like button. If you don't want to miss the next episode, subscribe and ring the bell. Stay tuned. See you next time.